Hello everyone and a warm welcome to Gnostic Currents. Uh, I'm going to take a little detour today um, off of the more ancient Gnostic uh, stuff I've been putting out and we're going to talk about William Shakespeare. Um, I've been into this uh, for quite a while. I'm actually going to do this in one take by the way with no edits at all so just bear with me. Um, but this is a huge subject for England actually. Um, and a very important one and many people don't like to talk about it too much I think people um, are, are m most will never ever question the authorship, authorship sorry authorship doubt and the many doubts that uh, exist over the true authorship of the sonnets and the plays uh, but there have been an increasing number of people recently who have been um, and I'm talking over the last few decades um, authorship doubt has been a fixture of the Shakespeare kind of canon and the history for a very long time and there are some very notable figures who um, who have questioned this uh, I'd like to just point out uh, the website doubtaboutwill.org uh, if you go to that website you'll find some pretty interesting kind of uh, foundational material about why people doubt and what I'm going to do today is just quickly run through um, a few little data points, I suppose. And then we're going to look into the book um, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. Now, there are two books named Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. Um, one of them is simply Shakespeare Beyond Doubt and the other written by detractors of the or mainstream authorship um, uh, canon orthodoxy um, wrote another book shortly after called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt with a question mark uh, after doubt um, and if you uh, if you go back on onto the website doubt, uh, doubt about will you're going to find you can actually sign the the de declaration of of uh, what's it called the declaration of reasonable doubt that's right now there are 4,608 uh, verified signatures and 769 academic signatures as well. Uh, these are uh, these range uh, from from actors, um, TV personalities, uh, academics of all, all kinds of qualities, um, high court judges even. Um, and it's, a, it's also worth pointing out that, as I said, there are some pretty big names that have questioned uh, the orthodoxy around this uh, for quite a long time. And they include William James, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Mark Twain, uh, Walt Whitman, Charles, uh, Charlie Chaplin, sorry, Sigmund Freud, Orson Welles and Derek Jacobi. I think he recently, recently passed away uh, and Mark Rylance as well. Uh, uh, f just a few people of note so we're in good company uh, I'd also like to point you towards Alexander Waugh's uh, web uh, sorry a YouTube channel you can just type in Alexander Waugh and he's Evelyn Waugh's grandson by the way uh, a phenomenal uh, fella and he's got some great uh, information about the real authorship and the, the person who most likely was the real William Shakespeare um, there's little dispute, I think, that there were a few hands involved in finalising the first folio. Um, but what I'm going to do just very quickly is run through uh, it's, uh, 21 re good reasons to doubt that, that Shakespeare was Shakespeare. And it's from the book. Uh, doubt, uh, sorry, uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, uh, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. So I'm just going to give you a little foundational a uh, set of reasons why uh, we we don't believe and there's 21 good reasons to doubt that Shakespeare was Shakespeare and here we go one people often think Shakespeare claimed to have written the works no such record exists nor did any family member or descendant ever claim that he was the author Shakespeare not that either of his daughters would have left such a record since neither could write no contemporary indicated that they thought of him as the author until long after he died. At least 10 people who knew of both Shakespeare and the author never connected the two. Number two, 
during the lifetime of William of Stratford, 1564 to 1616, nobody ever claimed to have met the poet dramatist Shakespeare. A few people indicated at that time that they thought the name was a pseudonym. Orthodox scholars ignore the possibility of a pen name and treat every occurrence of the name Shakespeare as reference to Mr. Shakespeare, but no reference to the author specifically identified Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare sorry, of Stratford during his lifetime. Number three. Contrary to popular perception that Shakespeare became prom a prominent public figure, no record shows that he ever addressed the public directly after he, his first two dedications. And none shows that either Elizabeth I or James I ever met him or mentioned his name as a professional actor. We do not know any role he ever played in any play or any on any date, nor... Does any contemporary record show that anyone ever saw him act in any of his plays? Number four. Not one play, not one poem, not even a letter in Shakespeare's hand, Shakespeare's hand, uh, has ever been found. Very few authorial manuscripts of plays or poems from a period from the period survive, but no letters. Uh, Mr. Shakespeare, Mr. Shakespeare divided his time between London and Stratford, a situation conducive to correspondence. We have letters for most other major writers of the period, and even for some lesser ones. How is it that not one survived for the most prolific writer of them all? Number five. William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon never spelled his name Shakespeare in his life, and his name were almost... Sorry, and his name also was probably not pronounced the same as the author's name. There is a clear, consistent difference between the spelling of the author's name on the works and the spellings of Mr. Shakespeare's family name in the Stratford Church records. Even the Orthodox used to make even the Orthodox uh, they made this the, they themselves made a typo here. Even the Orthodox scholars used to make the distinction, but now pretend to. Uh, the names are the same. Number six, the only writings said to be in Shakespeare's hand are six shaky, inconsistent signatures on legal documents. If these signatures are his, they reveal that he experienced difficulty signing his name. Some experts doubt that they are his and say they were done by law clerks. No, uh, no, yeah, no two are spelled the same way, and some say no uh, two letters are formed the same way. His signatures compare badly in those of known writers and most actors at the period. Uh, seven, nobody knows how Shakespeare, Shakespeare acquired the vast knowledge found in the works. The range would be remarkable for any man, let alone someone who never travelled or went to university. Not that a commoner, even in the rigid caste system of Elizabethan, of Elizabethan England, could not have managed to do it somehow, but how could it have happened without a le leaving a single trace? All we get from traditional biographers is speculation. 8. Orthodox scholars unable to account for how the author acquired, he acquired his knowledge fail, fall back on the idea that he was a genius and attribute it to his exceptional imagination. But even a genius must acquire knowledge and cannot do it by simply imagining things. Academic expert, experts on geniuses see little reason to think that Mr. Shakespeare was a genius. Number nine, the orthodox claim that we know more about Shakespeare than other writers of his time. The problem is not how much we know, but what we know. Over 70 docu over 70 documents relate to uh, him, but all are non-literary, church records, business dealings, and lawsuits. It is incredible to think of all these records survived, that all these records survived, but all relating to his alleged literary career are lost. 10. The Orthodox claim that the plays and poems prove Shakespeare was from Stratford. If he was born and raised in Stratford until he was well over 21, he would have had a Warwickshire accent and dialect. Yet these are both totally absent from the works. The works use either the language, use neither the language nor the history nor the geography of Warwickshire. Number 11. 
Mr. Shakespeare was a money-conscious businessman who repeatedly sued over small amounts of money, yet he never sued over any pirated edition of his alleged plays, and nothing shows that the author was ever paid to write or that he ever published any plays. 12. Mr. Shakespeare had a hard time getting approval for his application for a coat of arms. This makes little sense if he was the celebrated poet, author of Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, and had a noble patron. Warwickshire poet Michael Drayton, for example, had no trouble getting a coat of arms. 13. Shakespeare the poet wrote no commendatory, commendatory verse to anyone, and no one wrote any to him until long after Mr. Shakespeare died in 1616. The mutual silence is very odd, especially for a playwright who is said to have actively co collaborated with other writers. Number 14. Allegedly a prominent playwright under Shakespeare... Sorry, allegedly a prominent playwright under James I, Shakespeare was seldom present in London. Never in his career did he own a house in London or move his family there. Early in the reign of James I, records place him in Stratford while the plays were being performed at court. 15. Mr. Shakespeare Mr. Shakespeare's detailed, detailed will contains nothing that suggests he was any sort of writer. No books, plays, poems, letters, writing materials or intellectual property of any kind. Nothing that about it suggests in any way that this was a man who lived an intellectual life. 16. When William Shakespeare died in 1616, no one seemed to notice. Not so much as a letter refers to the author's passing. If we were, sh if we, if he were Shakespeare, it would have been memorialized by his literary peers. Even the fellow actors mentioned in his will had no known reaction. 17. The first value edition of Shakespeare's plays published seven years after Shakespeare died, and the monument erected in Stratford. The third church appeared to be part of a deception to give the impression that Shakespeare had been the author of the plays. Supporting evidence for this claim is provided in chapter 10 to 12 of this book. 18. Mr. Shakespeare was supposedly a full-time actor performing in different plays several times a week outdoors in English weather and an, on annual extended tours to the provinces. He was a theatre shareholder responsible for the business. He maintained two households three days journey apart commuting over bad Elizabethan roads. Yet he is also supposed to have written 37 plays, nearly all of them requiring extensive research, often in foreign languages. There is no other example then or since of a still working actor writing plays. 19. If the evidence were really as clear as orthodox scholars, scholars claim, they would just make it clear. Instead, they engage in personal attacks against anyone who disagrees with them. They promote a false stereotype of doubters, and this calls for credibility into question. their credibility into question. These tactics of traditional scholarship are especially of the Shakespeare birthplace trust are intended to, and especially, sorry, of the Shakespeare Birthday Trust, are intended to stigmatize and suppress the authorship issue and make it a taboo subject. The SBT uh, has a clear conflict of interest and no basis to claim to be neutral and objective. Number 21, by claiming that it is beyond doubt that Shakespeare uh, of Stratford wrote the works of Shakespeare, the SBT um, uh, implies that the issue has now been adjudicated and resolved but if they had to prove their case beyond doubt in an impartial forum they could not do so no impartial body has ever ruled beyond doubt that william shakespeare was shakespeare and finally 21 and this is a little extended uh, a petition uh, from cuthbert burbage to the Lord Chamberlain Philip Herbert provides strong evidence that William of Stratford was known as a player but not a playwright. This requires some explanation. In 1635, Cuthbert Burbage, brother of the famous actor Richard Burbage, had to prepare a petition to the Lord Chamberlain, then Philip Herbert, Earl of Pembroke and Montgomery, in a legal case. Richard Cuthbert Burbage were... Um, 
sorry, Richard and Cuthbert Burbage were the founder investors in the Globe Theatre in 1599, and William Shakespeare was a sharer. So Cuthbert knew Shakespeare, Shakespeare and surely knew the role he played in the acting company. In the petition, Cuthbert names those who risked their money by investing in the Globe, referring to Shakespeare and Shakespeare as one of several deserving men and also as one of several men players. This term, these terms don't make it sound like Cuthbert thought of him as the poet playwright Shakespeare, but rather just another member of the acting company. Perhaps the most important is the two spellings of the name, both without a medial E. By 1635, um, after the publication of the first two folios, the name Shakespeare was well known and would always have been spelled the way in print, that way in print, as Burbage surely knew. Furthermore, the man to whom he was writing, the Lord Chamberlain, Philip Herbert, was one of the two dedicatees with his brother William of the first and second folios. If Burbage knew that the, des if Burbage knew that the deserving man and man player were, was also the playwright, one would expect that he would have, one, spelled his name, Shakespeare and two made some reference to this Shakespeare being the one whose plays had been published in the first folio, 1623, and the second folio, 1632, both dedicated to Philip and his brother. This would have greatly strengthened the force of his petition. The fact that he did not do so suggests that he knew his fellow actor Sherry was not the author William Shakespeare. For all of these reasons, most of which are not addressed in Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, the Shakespeare authorship controversy should be regarded as legitimate. We hope you agree after considering the evidence and arguments presented in this book. And that book is Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, with a question mark. Um, it, ha it carries quite a few authors. Uh, it was a collaborative work. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out. Uh, it, it is, as I say, it's a... It, is a, a very big subject and it there are so many inputs and varying pieces of information uh, regarding this and a hell of a lot of, that we actually do know for sure and this is why i think if you're interested in elizabethan england and um and the the plays uh and and the in the massive implications for those plays through um, the last 400 years of English history and of, of everyone knows of course we all learn Shakespeare at, at school it would it is phenomenal and I have learned so much about the plays and about Elizabethan history through studying the plays in the light of the author that that most fits the bill um, and it does relate to my work here in, in Gnosticism and in occult um, theology and so on, uh, the plays carry a an under they have an undercurrent of um, occult and theosophical and Rosicrucian thought running through them, and it is quite clear that the the genius, the true genius that wrote the plays, was a um, a devotee of. Uh, the mysteries, essentially the mystery schools. You, you will, we will notice in um, works like *The Tempest* uh, that there are quite a few cues, and I mean some of the beautiful language involved. Some of the more mystical um, facets of the plays, of course, teach us that the writer knew some rather interesting things. I will leave that there. Uh, I'm going to do some follow-up. Um, uh, videos on this subject. Uh, I really want to cover quite a lot of it, but again, if you want to take a look at the website beyond um, doubtaboutwill.org and also Evelyn War's um, YouTube channel, it's simply Evelyn War, uh, spelt uh, Alex. Sorry, I'm so sorry, Alexander War. Evelyn, the grandfather, of course, everyone knows Evelyn War. Um, Alexander War, spelt W-A-U-G-H. Uh, there is some phenomenal stuff there, and he, he basically um, proves that many people, um, contemporaries, about six contemporaries, and um, uh, more, I think it's about 22, 25 um, people in all, um, 
uh, contemporaries and people coming and writing just after Shakespeare died, they all knew what was going on and they write in their works, in epigraphs and so on, and in letters between each other, that they knew who Shakespeare was. They use ciphers, they loved using ciphers back in Elizabethan England. It was uh, their, their uh, version of crossword puzzles essentially. And they, you know, they were an extraordinarily astute bunch. When you when you look to the aristocratic classes, they they learnt uh, all kind. You know, they were they were steeped in the classics and so on. Anyway, I'll leave that there. Thank you so much for uh, listening. If you made it through, thank you so much. And I will continue to do these videos. Um, thank you very much. Goodbye.